Well, I'm Rod Stevens. I'm principal with uh, Spaker Strategies. I'm a business development consulting firm, and I work connecting people and place and business together. Um, a lot of my career has been in real estate. The last few years, I've been working in uh, more and more business development of how do you make not just the outside of buildings come alive, but how do you fill the inside of buildings? And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, uh, I, I'd like to start this conversation today by saying we're, as of this month, we're three years into a recession. It's three years ago to this month that uh, Lehman Brothers melted down. Uh, three years ago in a week, I was at the Renaissance Center in Detroit at a, at a Creative Cities Summit talking about how to revitalize cities. And I walked out in the morning and there was a newspaper that said Chrysler and GM in merger talks. How far have we come in three years? And, and everybody says, are we going into a double dip recession? And I think it's important to realize that we are three years into a recession. And by many accounts, we might have three or four more years to go. I grew up in Oregon and that recession lasted for 10 years began in 1980 and it wasn't until 1990 that it's coming through. So this idea of waiting for us to come out of the recession, we could be waiting for a long time. And I guess the message here is that we have to take control in our own hands because if we wait around for somebody else to rescue, it's not happening. It's not happening at the state level, it's not happening at the federal level. In many ways it's not even happening at the um, city level. Um, in fact, my assumption for a lot of development these days is that Government at all levels has so many issues that it's dealing with in terms of slimming down that it may be three or four more years before we begin to see really innovative changes in government adjusting to the new low in revenue financing. So um, my own attitude in terms of looking at revitalization, redevelopment, is that we have to do it ourselves. And that's going to be the major theme of, of my talk today. I'm going to be splitting my time with Greg. Uh, if you think about how we're approaching this, Greg is going to be talking more about the physical place, getting back, back more to the development patterns. I'm going to be talking more about business itself. He's going to be handling the hardware, bricks and mortar. I'm going to be talking more about the software, what goes on in the businesses. Um, so it's up to us, and there are no silver bullets out there. There's not one thing that we can grab onto. Um, last year, I did a... Uh, an entry in the Urbano file, a national blog, on the 31 flavors of redevelopment. And I looked back and I counted at least 30 different types of redevelopment projects over the last 50 years that we've looked at. Cities are always looking at things, preferring art centers, zoos, aquariums. There's almost a flavor of the month approach on redevelopment. And none of these things ever completely do it. And particularly with no money these days, we have to be looking at how we can use our own skills not just going out and borrowing a pile of money and, develop in, and inviting a white knight developer in, but how can we redevelop our own businesses, our own communities? It's up to us. Um, and I think the, the reassuring or optimistic note here is, well, first of all, let me say, in my career, I, I came out of college in 1980, and I thought the mid-80s were bad in real estate. But this is far worse this time around in development because it's, we are finally at the structural change in the economy that people have been talking about for 40 years. None of this is unanticipated. It's just that in sort of a, a titanic shift, we've seen things happen very fast. But the, the structural changes have been there for a long time. And so we're living in a time that's both scary and exciting. Scary because we don't know how fast things are going to change. Exciting because there are all kinds of new possibilities opening up in telecom, in marketing, um, that if we get ahead of them, give us business opportunities. But we have to get out and we have to start moving and start realizing these things. And that's really what I want to talk about today. I'm going to be using an old story today um, to start with Stone Soup. And, and I just want to ask, how many of you folks know the story of Stone Soup? Raise your hand if you do. Okay, well that's about half the audience. Um, I actually brought this book along, and I'm going to be telling the story for about 30 seconds. I've dealt with this story twice in my life. Uh, the, the, the first time was in kindergarten, and, I heard it, and then the, um, the 
second time was about 10 years ago when I was working on a project for Paul Allen, who at the time was the world's fourth richest man. He had $25 billion. He was trying to figure out what to do with the, with the Coliseum area in Portland, and I was working on behalf of him trying to figure out what to do. He'd spent somewhere between $500,000 and a million dollars trying to figure out what to do with this area. He had a $200,000 master redevelopment plan, and nothing was working. And I was in charge of overseeing the consultants. And I went back to the consultants and I said, we have to uh, come up with our own plan. Whatever we do with this area, we have to do it with something that's community-based. And, and we have to quit spending money. We can't buy our way out of this problem. It's got to be rooted in the community. So the point of the story is just that even the richest people in the world can't make things happen if they're not locally rooted. So, business is moving fast. We've got to all get up to speed because it's going to leave us behind. India and China are moving. So, the story of Sean Stu is basically about three soldiers coming back from the Napoleonic Wars, or whatever wars you want to have. They're penniless, they have no food, they have no place to sleep, um, and, and basically government has broken down around them. And they're coming into this village, and they're saying, where are we going to sleep and eat tonight? And they come in, and everyone in the village has hidden themselves away. Fear prevails. In fact, they're hiding behind the doors. And as they're hiding behind the doors, the villagers are saying, here come three more soldiers. How can we possibly feed them? And so they're putting their food away up in the lofts and in other places. So the soldiers come into town and say, gee, what can we do? And people are hiding behind the doors. Everything's put away. And they start to tell a story, and they say, we have a fantastic recipe for stone soup. We've fed it to kings before. It's delicious. It's very simple. And this gets people's interest. And people say, oh, what does it take? And they said, oh, it's very simple. All we need is a pot, some water, and some stones. And the villagers are intrigued. And they say to themselves, oh, soup for, fit for a king, and it's that simple? Well." We have a terrain and we'll build a fire. We'll contribute that much. And so the, the stolders, they don't even have stones in their hands. They say, well, we can make this with local st stones. Do you have some stones? The villagers say, yes, we have some stones. And the villagers say, well, this is terrific soup, but it would be really good if we could just add some carrots or salt. And one of the women in the village says, oh, I have some carrots, I'll go get them. She runs into her bar and gets the carrots out of the hiding place and brings them in. Here she is coming. So they start, they cut those things up and they go, oh, this soup is terrific now. Now, if we just had a little bit of ham and some other things, and the villagers go out and they get more things. And, and as you can imagine, the story goes on and on. And by the end of the, by the end of the cooking, the soldiers have gotten the villagers to bring their food out from hiding and put it into the collective soup. It's five or ten ingredients. And at the end of the day, at the end of cooking, they have a large meal and everybody sits down and enjoys it together. And in fact, there is dancing at the end. So the point of the story is the assets are here in the community to make your future. You have to cook together. And that's a lot of what's going on in the world today is that we're figuring out what our assets are and how we cook together. I think one of the most important things about turnarounds in business these days in communities that have done it, the biggest national success stories are actually stories of terrible failure that started 20 or 30 years ago when people had their back up against the wall and they said we have to act and we have to do it ourselves. Believe it or not, one of the biggest success stories nationally in the country right now is Fargo, North Dakota. When I first heard this, I said, Fargo? You've got to be kidding. I was thinking of the movie. But in fact, Fargo's downtown is booming. It, it's, the area is really going to town. But what happened was about 20 or 30 years ago, Fargo was in terrible condition. And the people there said, gee, we can't get an outside developer to come in and rescue us. Nobody wants to come to Fargo. It's just too far out of the way. But we have this terrific movie theater here that we all went to see movies together in. And it was a source of community pride and a source of community memories. And they said, let's rehab this theater. 
and one thing led to another, and they, they rebuilt the theater, and then a hotel sprang up behind it, and a local electronics entrepreneur that had sold out to Microsoft kept his money in, and it's just been one thing after another, and today Fargo is one of the big success stories. Another one is Chattanooga. I went through Chattanooga in 1988, and it was a dump. It was just a terrible place. And yet, today, Chattanooga is one of the great, known as one of the great economic success stories. I was at a conference in Boulder on Friday, and I heard the mayor of Chattanooga speak. It's a place that's known as extremely green, extremely wired. And he said that what catalyzed their change, their turnover, was Walter Cronkite coming on the news in the 1970s saying, Chattanooga is the dirtiest air in the country. It had always been a steel town. And they said, we can't be the dirtiest place in the country. And they set about changing it. But they had this national identity crisis where they said, we're known as the dirtiest place. We've got to change this around. And today, Chattanooga is one of the cleanest places. In fact, it's known for its green economy. I grew up in Portland, which is today known as a green, you know, very, very progressive place. We always took it for granted that Portland was green, but we had sort of this underlying contradiction in Oregon that we were making our money off logging old growth forests. So Portland was extremely green, but we had the spotted owl problem. And what happened in the 1980s, when interest rates went to 21%, is that the Oregon economy crashed, and simultaneously the timber companies had pretty much logged every last tree. So Georgia Pacific uprooted itself in 1982 and said, we're leaving because of the, of the environmental regulations. We're going back to Atlanta. And the Oregonian, which had always been a Republican pro-industry paper, said, ran a lead editorial that said, no, you're not. You're leaving because you don't have anything here. And it was an extremely cathartic moment because the city was probably its worst ever. And suddenly they were saying, we're no longer dependent on one industry. And we're going to be a green city, and we're not going to live with this contradiction of logging and timber and our own green economy any longer. I would date Portland's modern prominence to that editorial when Georgia Pacific left town and the people said, we're going to be different from here on. I've been involved in an effort the last six months with UC Davis called Feeding a Healthy Planet. And this was provoked by the state cutting Davis's funding by 20 or 30 percent. Brand new chancellor, big background in biotech, and biochemistry, patents and startup stewards name. But she's been brought in to turn the place around. And she wants to do industry academic collaboration. And so we've been trying to figure out how to make UC Davis and the area around it the food capital of the world for research and development. And believe it or not, in the course of just looking, we've come up with three industry deals with multinationals. So just the very fact of looking, of turning over stones, is causing progress in a place like Davis, which is profoundly anti-business. One of the most interesting things to me these days is that our economy is changing so much that the old labels no longer make sense. Manufacturing, <coughs> high-tech, food, all of these things are changing. You know, one of the great success stories here is Mirancho. And I was joking beforehand, Mirancho product, Mirancho makes a third world product with first world technology, computerized assembly lines. It's taking an old product and applying new technology. So is Mirancho high tech? Is it food manufacturing? What is it? None of these labels make sense any longer. Um, and so to say manufacturing is in decline in this industry, in this country, I think is a misnomer. These labels no longer make sense. Are you, are you a food supplier? Are you a manufacturer? Are you an equipment maintainer? You're all of those things. I think that San Leandro has this fantastic background of making things that this community needs to acknowledge. You don't want to just be another extension of Kaiser Permanente's back office. You don't necessarily just want to be an extension of Silicon Valley. You want to be something strong in your own right. And between Ghirardelli and Mirancho and Scandic Spring and these other things, this is a community that's used to making things. And what it really comes down to in a community is not the industry of the community, but the skills of the people who live and work there. The people who come into work, the people who live there. Industries change all the time. You know, the, the, 
Um, up where I live in the Seattle area, Eddie Bowers is, you know, the retailer. It gets coded as a clothing chain, but in fact half the people who work at that headquarters work in IT. That company has been through bankruptcy a few more, a few times. If it goes through one more, I can guarantee you that half the people working at Eddie Bowers will be going two miles across town to apply for jobs at Microsoft. So these industry classifications, this cluster analysis, can actually be kind of misleading. And what you really want to do when you're looking at your strengths, what you have to cook with in a community, is to say, what can our own people do? Because those are the durable things. The VF industries, the north faces of the world come and go, but the skills of the community stay there no matter what. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to hold on to these people through this change and allow people to do what they do best. So here's an example of a mixed industry from across the bay in San Francisco, and I love this company, Timbuktu. My own bag over here, Eagle Creek, I think I paid 70 bucks for that bag 10 years ago. Timbuktu is now selling bags for um, customized for 150 to 200 bucks. And the beauty of Timbuktu is that it's a combination of high tech and low tech. High tech in an online customized ordering system, and low tech in the sense that they're taking seamstresses, people that really know how to run a sewing machine, and making these things in San Francisco, one of the highest cost operating cities in the world, and they're making bags here. And they take your order online and ship it in two business days. Phenomenal supply chain. Here's the website for ordering this thing. I went online and started making it, just playing around with it, and I could customize these things. I could customize the um, about eight different features on this. And I think when I was done with the customizing, I was up to 200 bucks on the bag. But think about it, if you're a commuter and you're using this every day, you say, it's almost like my bicycle. Yeah, I can buy the $70 bag over at, you know, at the chain store at the big box. But if I'm going every day to work and I'm sweating through this, I want a bag that I take pride in. And here's a company doing it. It's actually making things here in, in the Bay Area. So one of the things that I've had discussions with Gay about is, where is manufacturing and the economy going? And I think this is, I guess my vision for San Leandro is that you guys could be known for making things. But not just making old fashioned things, that you can be making all kinds of things. That, that the kids coming out of the high school here are not only managing these businesses, but some of these people are glorified machinists who understand how to program computers. How many here have heard about 3D printing? Raise your hands. Okay, almost everybody. It's, it's fantastic. Here's an example. 3D printing with the printer, the CAD design, and the final product. Here's something made with 3D printing. Dave was telling me about the Maker's Fair in San Mateo. There are about three of these in North America. One in New York, one in Vancouver, and one in San Mateo. Where else in the world but the Bay Area would you have stuff like this coming out? Would you actually have a Maker's Fair with a high-tech piece of machinery that could produce something like this? You know, we talked about medicine in the future. What if San Leandro produced medical prosthetics with the 3D printing, where you guys are actually the folks that make these things? These are possibilities that we need to be looking towards the future for. Not only talking about what does the building look like on the outside and how do people come together, but what's going on on the inside of the building. I think this is stuff that's really important to the community is to say, what are we going to make and sell to the world? What's our stone soup to the world? When people talk about Bangalore, or Chengdu, or places in China, how are we going to be known? For that matter, how do we position ourselves against Malpitas, Redwood City, uh, you know, Rohnert Park? What is our particular identity that sets us apart? Here's another, here, here's a sole for Timberland made with 3D printing. You know, tremendous possibilities here. This is an ad for Scandic Spring. I'm sorry I don't have a Mirancho, but um, you know, here's one of your manufacturers that makes high-tech springs for, for Silicon Valley. So last year when Greg and I were here, we talked about Mirancho and, and Scandic Spring. I think one of the challenges for you as a community is, we know of two stories. 
You've got the old stories, Ghirardelli. You've got the lost stories of North Face. North Face, by the way, started in Berkeley. It came down here, and then it moved on to Alameda. What's the new, what's the next North Face? I can guarantee you it's already happening here. But I think one of the challenges for you as a business community are, just, are to write down 10 of these stories. You've got two, we know about two. But if you're going to market yourselves to the outside world and know who you are, come up with 10 good stories at one page each saying what makes you distinctive, what allows you to cook that special soup. So, you're going to hear all kinds of words in business. The, you know, the, the latest word is resiliency, which replaces sustainability, which replaces who knows what. The big word for the last two years has been talent. I maintain there's only one important word that goes on forever, and that's authenticity. And that's being true to who you are. And, and you know, Coke had this down. I don't know why they ever let this slogan go. It was, it was dumb on their part. So, as you think about your future, you have to be true to who you are, because that's what sets places apart. The success of Boulder, of Portland, of Las Gatos, of Austin, Madison, all these places, they have a very distinct possibility. They didn't go out and come up with a fancy slogan that people didn't understand. As a matter of fact, all these great places that we hear about, I defy you to come up with a slogan for them. Other than keep Austin weird, none of them have a brand slogan. It's just that they're, they, they have, they're so true to themselves that people go, oh, I know what that place is like. So, not only be authentic, but be distinctive. You know, be something that catches your, catches the other person's eye that says, I want to be a part of that place. I'd like to put money into that town. You have to be true to yourself and you have to be distinctive. Now, getting back to this earlier question of industry labels, I call this slide black, white, or plaid. You know, uh, how many here are familiar with Richard Florida and the creative class? Architects, lawyers? Okay, so Richard Florida's person is this person, you know, the, the designer dressed in black with the French beret. And this is flavor of the month right now for economic development people, is we want biotech folks. Everybody wants biotech. Yeah. Tell me a town that doesn't want biotech and tell me a town that says that it's not good at it. But this is the person that works at Timbuktu. By the way, this person may be working at the biotech plant too, the way he's, he's dressed. So, I think in the future we're going to have to have all of these things together. And if you sort of break these down, you go head, hands, heart for design. There's three different kinds of intelligence we have. You know, our hands to make things, we're craftsmen. Our heads, we're analytic, we're business types. And our heart, we're good marketing people. Or we particularly understand how to deliver great hospitality. It's going to take all of these things, and so we've got to avoid these labels of, gee, we're going to go after biotech, or we're going to go after design industries. It's all of these things, but I, I would submit that San Leandro has particular strength over here, a distinction there. One of the most interesting challenges for business these days is embracing the change of a new generation. The question here is, what do the young have to teach us? Get ready to get out of the way in some ways. Um, I had a discussion on Friday with the workplace director for Jones Lang LaSalle, one of the world's largest real estate advisory firms. And he said, and I disagree with him, he said, place doesn't matter. We're so electronic savvy these days that anyone over 35 or so is an electronic immigrant and anyone under 35 is a native. And with Facebook and all these other things, place won't matter. I disagree with him, but I agree with him to the extent that people under 35 are learning a new way of working and that we have to embrace this. And that the high school crowd in the back here are really the folks that we need to be talking with today. Um, Redmond High School, which is where Microsoft is headquartered, for a long time was having 7 o'clock a.m. tutorials once a week for the kids to teach the teachers how to use the electronics. You know, th this is the generational change going on at age 14, and believe me, these were the kids of Microsoft employees, so you can imagine they knew what they were, they were talking about. But for us to really go forward in the future, 
we've got to embrace this generation of change that's going on. Believe me, the U.S. is an aging population compared with China and India. These are other markets with huge numbers of young people that are studying hard, and we're, by comparison, we look like England. We're an older country. We've got, we're sort of set in our ways. If we're going to compete with these other countries, we have to embrace the change, and that means embracing our young people. By the way, they're the ones that will help us with our social security. Some of what's going on here, I, I really do believe that place is important, but what is happening in the world? Hewlett Packard did a survey two years ago, found that only a third of its desks were occupied at any one time. Two thirds of them were empty. IBM, 40% of its people work off site. 40% of its people work either in customers' offices or at home. Only 60% works there. So the workplace itself is becoming less important. What is important in this digital age is that when people come together face to face, it's more important than ever that that workplace work as a place for collaboration. Collaboration is the big word this year, the capital C word, collaboration. So in terms of rebuilding suburbia, reworking the workplace, what we have to do is we have to remake these places so that they're face-to-face -face places. The knowledge economy, the value-added economy, we add value to things by making good decisions. We make good decisions by knowing the other people and having trust in them. We have trust in them by getting to know them. We get to know them face-to-face. -face. Place is so important. We can't replace it with iPhones, iPads, Twitter, the rest of these things. There are times when you have to come together face to face. And so the places that matter, the places that are valuable, are the places that allow people to come together. And that's part of your place making challenge. In the workplace, in the neighborhood, at the city level, three different scales. I'm going to talk a little bit about in the workplace. So first of all, the software of managing. This just highlights some of the different changes that are going on. Decision making, skills, boomers, they made it themselves, millennials do it collectively. Learning style boomers did it formally, millennials do it together. The way we work is changing. Millennials are changing where and how we work. We treated the workplace in the past sort of like the brakes on the car. They're there when we need them. We haven't treated it strategically. If you're a business owner these days, or a developer, you have to start thinking about making the workplace a tool for work, updating it to reflect who we are today, not who we were 30 years ago. Fundamentally, we need to make the workplaces more social. I call it the water heater gaining respect. There used to be all kinds of, you know, Blondie ads 30 and 40 years ago about getting away from the water heater. Today, we're actually trying to create places to bring people together because they're not gossiping. They're talking about how, how to do their jobs better. A lot of people go outside the office for more important discussions, for the most important decisions. In fact, it's arguable that the most important decisions are made at Starbucks or over the white tablecloth table. Why should we have to go outside of our workplace to have conversations like this. Why should we have to drive across town? It's silly. Many of us are self-employed. Starbucks is our meeting room. Interestingly, this, this um, photo is taken at Zeitgeist Cafe in Seattle. The seeds of the modern economy were sowed at South Park in San Francisco about four blocks below market in 19, early 1970s. That's where it all started in the United States in terms of changes, people working together, moving back into the city. Might have started at Soto in New York, but in the mid-1980s, when, when Portland was at its worst is when the Pearl District, the modern loft district, got started. Later in the 80s, Pioneer Square came along. Later in the 80s, Yale Town in Vancouver. These are all places where independent people started to come together. They came together at independent cafes. 
Now we have Starbucks everywhere. But this is the kind of work that's been the basis for the modern economy for the last 30 or 40 years. We just haven't seen it, but it's becoming closer and closer and closer to us to where it's now in our own workplaces. And we've got to recognize this. This is a brand new piece of furniture from Herman Miller, the office company. Where would you put this in your own offices? Do you have a space to put this? Or would you say, quit talking guys, go back to work? In which case they'd probably go home and work on their computers. But do you really think that they're talking about football scores? No, they're probably talking about work if they're at work at all. This is where the economy is heading and this is what we need to be encouraging at all three levels, in the workplace, in the neighborhood, at the city. Step back for a second. The last 10 years in the United States have been about consumption. Most of the projects that Greg and I have been involved in as real estate people, as revitalization and business development, have been about consumption. Housing over retail, specialty retail centers, four-story transit-oriented housing, blah, blah, blah. It's all stuff you do with a mortgage or that you buy. The world is moving back towards investment, back towards business development, back towards making things. We have to start putting the same focus on our workplaces on places where people come together that we put into housing and retail the last 10 years. It's time to quit worrying about how we spend money and start worrying about how we make it and how we work together. I did a little project up in Port Townsend recently, which is literally a 6,000 person town at the end of the road. It's a great place. They said, we're always getting hit up by our downtown merchants to do redevelopment for retail. We think we have a professional services industry here. Would you help us quantify it? I ran the numbers, used tax stuff, and I found that there was one business for every five households in Port Townsend. An invisible economy that, in which case, some of the people were downtown, but they were scattered all over the peninsula. This is a, a rural area. I can assure you that you have the same thing here in San Leandro, that you have dozens or even hundreds of businesses that you don't know are there because somebody is working out of their home or in a small thing. Your economy is here, you just don't know it. In Port Townsend, I actually found that the professional services industry was larger than their boat building industry and slightly smaller than tourism. When you took out all the spending on grocery stores, Professional services actually contributed more to the local economy than the tourism for which they were known. So one of the things is you've got to get under these numbers, and almost the only way to get under numbers is by talking anecdotally with people around you. You can do the stats, I can do these for you, but at the end of the day you have to just get to know one another and figure out what you're strong in. For one thing, the stats usually lie. I, I found diaper services coded as professional services by the government. So. Uh, the only way to really get to know your community and your neighbors is by working together. What was one of the most interesting things in Port Townsend is that they have a very well developed boat building, boat repair industry there. To the extent that people are taking fancy yachts up I-5 to have them repaired there. But in Port Townsend, I call this the Wall Street of the marine trades industry. People come together in the morning and swap stories about who's got work. They come together and they talk about how to solve a certain problem. This is what's been going on in business for hundreds of years. You know, and, and, and people come together just like guilds and crafts in the Middle Ages. One of the biggest challenges for the modern professional worker is disconnection. You know, if, if you're not working in the boatyard, where do you go in the morning to find, to get stimulation to talking to other people? and more and more of us are working on. So this is a, both a challenge and an opportunity for San Leandro, is how do you connect yourselves back? Kind of wrapping up here, this, what schools can learn from Google, IDEO, and Pixar? This, this, this is from um, Fast Company, which I urge you to kind of take a look at pretty often. I, I think it's the best business magazine out there. What, what struck me about this, when I read this, was what schools can learn from Google, IDEO, and Pixar, but also what can business learn? What really struck me about this is that we're, we're heading towards a convergence where 
if we really have well-designed, up-to-date schools, the really well-designed, up-to-date schools should really look almost no different from the really well-designed, up-to-date workplaces. And so this thing could be, what can the average business learn from Google, IDEO, and Pixar? These are places that are known for bringing people together. Back to this idea of collaboration, inside the workplace, outside the workplace, at the city level. Let's think about assembly spaces like this, but everywhere. Let's, let's, let's get that furniture, let's get that infrastructure inside to allow people to talk together. This is the, the project I've been working on for UC Davis for the last six months. I've been working for the Chancellor's Office. Very interesting things where literally we're talking about creating a home for business on campus. One of my recommendations has been to integrate collaboration into the undergraduate um, curriculum so that internships are part of the undergraduate experience. But part of creating a home for business there is, is having business and industry work so close together that they're partners. Um, We've had some of the leading people in the world on food talk about the need for this to go on. So this is real stuff, this kind of collaboration. One of the models that, that I think might be applicable to San Leandro is actually from Arlington, Texas, where the Super Bowl was last year. It's a very middle to lower middle income community, smack dab in the Dallas-Fort Worth area between, um, between those two cities, right under the airport doesn't have a lot of resources, relatively low education, but phenomenal partnership between the schools, the Chamber of Commerce, and one of the five major universities in the University of Texas system, University of Texas or Arlington. They're working together, those things. So much so that at Christmas time every year, oh, and, and the fourth partnership there is, is um, the community college. At Christmas time every year, they have a program for taking high school kids and getting them ready for college and community college. And the way this works is that the janitors at University of Texas open the doors at Christmas over the Christmas break for programs run by the community college and attended by high school students to get them up to speed to teach them what high school is like. But how often do you have the doors of one institution being open for another institution to teach, teaching to a third? This is a sort of cross-institutional stuff going on. I have great hopes for Arlington because they're just out there doing it. They're just out there getting these, these, these buildings used and they're saying, okay, I know that I'm not higher ed in the University of Texas system, I'm a community college, but let's work together. At Davis, they've actually put a community college on campus to provide a steady stream in. So this mixing and matching of anchor institutions is becoming critically important. Why? Because they're major assets in any community. And the assets they're dealing with, the, the fancy faculty members and the kids that need help getting in. They're just doing it together. So a couple of recommendations about how to move forward. Next steps. By the way, this is Pixar's headquarters, designed for bringing people together. This is lab in a can. This is a, a friend's project in Sacramento, where he's actually slicing and dicing the space up next to a medical center to bring in new medical-related projects. He's actually putting them in a basement. Cheap, scalable, great location. One of the things Greg's going to talk about next, by the way, is breaking the development and the obstacles down here into bite-sized pieces. If you've got a building that's too large, break it up. If you've got tasks that are too large and formidable, break it up into small things. So, a couple of recommendations to summarize here. One, be distinctive. Two, be true to yourself. That, that's where you start. So, that question is, how will you be known? Are you telling your story? Who's with you in this effort? Who are your partners? You can't do it alone. Learning from strangers. Greg and I are strangers here, but we still have stories to tell, like the story in Stone Soup, where the community was divided and hiding behind the door, and they were excited by strangers came, who came in and helped bring them together. 
getting on the road is turning out to be very important these days of, of learning. Bite-sized efforts. I think maybe the, one of the most important things these days, making everyone's organization a learning organization. If you're in the knowledge economy and you're not learning, you're going to be left behind really fast. The Chamber of Commerce itself, I'm trying to do this with mine back up in, in Washington State, turning it from a kind of a card drop organization for self-promotion into a learning organization. After my mortgage, my single biggest expense is health care. I drop twelve to $15,000 a year on it. Do you think I'd spend $100 to go to a carefully orchestrated seminar on how to buy health care? I can, I'll do that in a New York minute. How to use social media? I don't know how to do it. If the Chamber of Commerce had a good event on how to use social media, I'd spend $100 and in, in four hours if, it, if I knew it was going to be done. I think every community has got to start taking these organizations and turning them around into learning organizations where they're all assisting us in our business activities. This isn't about regulation any longer. This is about getting ahead, increasing your revenue, and cutting your cost. We need help to do it. Not forgetting the anchors. The Kaiser Hospital out there, it's going to be buying a lot of stuff. It's going to be having a lot of nurses and doctors going out for lunch. Finally, creating an action list and just starting to work down it. Why is Chattanooga successful today? Because about 20 years ago, they had a lot of community discussions. I think they involved 15,000 people in Chattanooga in discussion saying, where do we want to go? And you know what they made? They made a to-do list. And they said, okay, let's figure out what we're going to do, but let's break it up in bite-sized pieces. So they would take an item off the to-do list shelf, and they'd do it, and then they'd take another, and another, and another, and another. One, they got things done. But two, they learned how to do them together, and they built community by doing it. They didn't just talk about it, they started doing it. And I've talked to several people from Chattanooga and I said, what's the essence of your success here? And they said, well, we listened to everybody. We didn't rewrite what they said. We, we listened and we put it down. And number two is we just started doing it. We started taking items off the to-do list and getting them done. And we learned how to do it and that drew us together. And I think that's looking forward to the future here. That's going to be your challenge here in San Leandro is Figure out what your story is, who you want to be. In terms of working with government several years from now, when it comes out of its slump, knowing what you want from it, asking it, having a prioritized list, saying, we have to have this. But most importantly, working together yourselves, beginning to build those local connections. Because that's going to be the thing that sets Landry, San Leandro apart over the long run, is if you're successful, people are going to say, I want to be a part of that place. Thanks.